most highly respected nonpartisan venue for civil discourse on matters of vital import. And that's going to happen today, even though it's not Friday. You may have noticed that today we are at the sanctuary of the First Congregational Church. We are very grateful to the church for allowing us to use their gorgeous building. We also thank our program co-sponsor, Oregon Physicians for National Health Program. To learn more, please visit the table at the back. And we thank, as always, our media partners. KGW will make this available live on their website. And you can also find it available on their Facebook feed and news app. And TV viewers will watch a re recording of this performance uh, through Open Signals community media television stations. We are very grateful for the support of our media to make these forums available to many more people. And finally, we thank our volunteers and our staff who enable us to put on Oregon's best civic programs. Please join me in showing our appreciation to everyone who has made this event possible. <laughs> Oregon faces a healthcare crisis, as does the entire country. Very few of us can depend upon getting the health care we need when we need it without risking bankruptcy. Most people here are just one major hospitalization away from financial catastrophe. In response, the Oregon legislature appointed a universal access to health care work group with the Herculean task of finding a way to make affordable, effective health care available to all of us. Members of this work group included legislators, physicians, and representatives of all aspects of Oregon's healthcare industry. The work group released its report one month ago. I was really interested in what was in this report, especially as I was a member of this work group. Here to discuss the findings of this remarkable work group are three of my colleagues. Representative Andrea Salinas lives in Lake Oswego, represents House District 38. She's a member of the House Health Care Committee and she chaired our group, not a task for the faint of heart. Martin Taylor is the executive director of the Oregon Nurses Association. And previous to that, he was Executive Director of Public Affairs with CARE Oregon and helped implement and design Oregon's coordinated care organizations. <laughs> and we have former Representative Rich Vile. It pains me to say former representative. He lives in Hillsboro. He represented House District 26. While in the legislature, he also served on the House Health Care Committee. He is still chair of the Washington County Planning Commission and has returned to his 30-year career as a land use attorney in Oregon. And our moderator, <laughs> our moderator is Vanetta Abdul Latif. She's director of Multnomah County's Integrated Clinical Services. This means she is responsible for 25 health centers, eight primary care clinics, seven pharmacies, six dental sites, and the health care of more than 70,000 residents in Multnomah County. Please welcome our moderator and our panelists. Vanetta. Good evening. Is that working? Great. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. I'd like to actually ask my um, colleagues here, are we, would you be okay if I called you by your first names? Okay, great, thank you. All right, appreciate that. Um, so I'd like to start with you, Andrea. Would you talk to us a little bit about what were your goals when you joined the um, work group? My goal is 
first to avoid it as much as possible. But Chair Greenlick tasked me as the chair of the work group. And um, we talked with our um, legislative policy research analyst and um, Representative Greenlick ahead of time to kind of figure out what he really wanted from the work group. And what his desire was, was to figure out, despite whatever the federal government might come up with in terms of rolling back the Affordable Care Act or putting new restrictions on how we spent Medicaid funding, whether it was in terms of block grants or, or anything that just um, really destabilized the current healthcare system, and I know system is a very broad term, the healthcare system that we have now, um, figuring out ways to make sure that Oregon was on a track that continued our um, healthcare transformation that we've, we had started years ago. And so that was truly the goal was what can we do despite what the federal government may do that will put us on track to continue healthcare transformation and also set us on a path towards something that looks like single payer or universal access to care. And as we define that, it was really um, more care, better care for more people for less money. But I think in... Um, <laughs> But I think um, truly it was also to make sure that we were bridging this gap of any unforeseen negative policy um, changes coming down from the federal government. And I would like you to keep that answer in mind because I'm going to come back to you later to ask you how much of your goals you actually were able to accomplish. Um, Martin, I'd like to move on to you. What, what, um, what really drove you to be a part of this um, work group? You've been in this work for a long time. You keep showing up at the table, and we've been talking about universal health care for a long time. Why did you decide to step into this um, role? Well, first off, uh, like Andrea, it's hard to say no when Mitch asks you. So start <laughs> with the obvious. I was invited. Uh, you know, I. I work for the Oregon Nurses Association. That's 15,000 nurses around Oregon, most of them hospital nurses, but also public health nurse practitioners. Uh, our commitment as an organization to getting healthcare recognized as a fundamental human right in the Oregon Constitution is longstanding. We've been there in fight after fight. Uh, we have not yet been able to get that on the ballot, but this was the closest thing. Uh, a work group to identify how to get to universal care is the right place for nurses to show up and say, we want that roadmap. That is, in fact, a societal goal. It's a goal of our membership. And uh, I think frequently in the really big conversations around healthcare reform, the nurses' voices sometimes fade out, that there's an inclination to go to politicians or the CEOs of hospitals or insurance companies or you know, we love our physician friends, but they tend to show up at the table more often. This was an opportunity to make sure that the nurse's voice uh, was heard. Now, I'm not personally a nurse, but uh, we have a cabinet health policy that followed the work, so I was able to keep them informed, and I feel like the, the role of nursing in this conversation was important. Thank you. Rich, I'd like to ask you, can you tell us a little bit about why you believe universal health care access is important and how you brought that philosophy to your work on the work group? Uh, well, thank you. I didn't come with that philosophy, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, even though I'm sitting stage left, I'm the right of this group. Um, I, I did not get reelected this last time, and I attribute that to the fact that uh, we have a petulant four-year-old at the head of a party that I've been part of for the last 30 years. And um, uh, with the R behind my name, it was the scarlet letter this time around. I was a 35-year real estate attorney who went to the legislature because I wanted to get a road built on the west side of of the uh, metro area. I did not know the difference between Medicare and Medicaid when I showed up at the legislature, honestly. Sad as that may seem. Uh, none of my family's in the, in the uh, healthcare industry. We're all teachers or business people or lawyers. I really knew nothing about it. But, just like everybody else, I've had personal experiences. I had a kidney stone a few years ago where the MRI, for the, or the whatever you call it, the CAT scan for that kidney stone cost me $4,000 when I finally saw the bill. 
and then a few months later went to a local clinic and got the same thing for $400. And clearly, just like everyone, I know something is wrong. Um, I don't know what I said. I don't know for sure why. Am I, yeah, I'm still alive. But the same guy that Andrea and Martin have talked about. Chair Mitch Greenlick of the uh, House Health Care Committee, who's been there a long, long time, um, I think took a shine to me. We are good friends, and he asked me to be on the Health Care Committee, and I'm grateful for that. To be honest with you, I came to this really skeptical about whether a single-payer system, universal health care, was the right idea. At the urging of people like Sam Metz, I read a great deal. I listened carefully during the process, and in the end, I do believe that we have to come to a place where we're um, going to be better than we are. I will make this observation. The only folks that have done it so far successfully or even remotely successfully in the U.S. happened to be another guy with an R behind his name, Mitt Romney, in, in Michigan a few years ago. I'm confident that it's not a partisan issue. It is an issue that if we all understand it, we can find a solution. Yeah, Massachusetts. Massachusetts, not Michigan. His dad was Michigan, that's right. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I, I want you to hold on to the mic for a minute. I'd like to do a follow-up. So you talked a little bit about um, not being there when you started, which I think is really great, and I appreciate um, your talking a little bit about your journey. Share with us one or two compelling um, conversations or arguments that you heard that made you really look at universal access um, in a different way. And I think this would be really important for us as a group, especially being a Republican, how um, people who understand um, um, single payer and the possibilities of getting people all under one tent, um, we may be preaching to the choir sometimes. And so um, having a different perspective and hearing what are compelling arguments I think would be helpful for us. Thank you. Clearly one of the issues is just cost versus outcome. Um, those of us who are kind of raised by parents who were more about let's uh, put in a fair day's work for a fair day's pay, and maybe that's why I was a Republican since I was a young man, um, tend to think in terms of cost and outcome. And when I began to understand that we were spending um, by many factors, more than many of our brothers and sisters around the world, and getting worse outcomes, it was jarring to me. I think that is a message that if presented properly, and if we can find a way to set aside partisanship, can really make a difference. And I know it has among my conservative friends. I, I, in my conversations with many of my conservative friends, they've come around, when we talk about it that way. But as long, unfortunately, as we're worried about who gets to put the score up for the next campaign, I fear that we won't get that message out very effectively. Thank you for that. Um, so um, this next question, I'd actually like to um, pose this to all of you, and I'll start with you, Andrea. Um, so your group was charged with changes to Oregon's health care system that brings Oregon closer to universal care, but with only minimal disruption. Christmas has passed. <laughs> we had the magic season. Is that actually possible? So what I came up with, and I think what um, in talking with a lot of the different work group members, um, minimal disruption is tough, right? We've kind of been going through um, what I would consider minimal disruption, and it's still pretty big disruption, um, given the creation of our coordinated care organizations, and given just that you know we have applied for waivers that nobody else in the United States has in how we um, obtain Medicaid um, dollars and how we use them. So I would say that um, to continue down that path is kind of the direction that I would like to see 
us go in terms of setting the stage for additional waivers post 2020, knowing that we'll be we'll need to capture those Medicaid and Medicare dollars. We'll need to get permission from the federal government to um, capture them and utilize them in a different way and try to move folks into the system that we have now that is um, where we do have um, you know, a, set, a good set of benefits um, that include um, mental health as well as um, primary care and prevention services. Um, something that seems like it's affordable. We'll need to make sure that our networks um, are adequate and available statewide. But I think what we need to do is to continue down a path and then start to make changes within the CCO model that we have. Knowing that it's not the perfect system still and yet, and that's why we're talking about CCO 2.0 and what are the next steps that we have to take to kind of tighten the regulations that we have there now. How do we increase transparency? How do we get better health care um, and better health outcomes? So what, is, you know, what do value-based payments look like? And start to get the private sector to compete with that CCO model that I think we've established really as the Oregon healthcare identity. Martin. Well, so first observation is uh, we were charged with minimal disruption, and it may well be that what this system needs is less than minimal disruption. But Absolutely. let's start with that. Um, I think there were some very tangible products of the work group that are worth mentioning um, that would be in the category of a reasonable amount of disruption. Obviously, it's a minimal to who, right? But we could reduce a lot of the administrative costs. That was part of the report. We could improve our enrollment process. A very simple example could be um, you have presumptive eligibility for Medicaid if you appear at a hospital emergency room, but why isn't that not apply to your primary care doctor or to the mental health system? That might be a way of enrolling more people and making sure there's more coverage. Um, we talked about increasing the expectations on CCOs to be connected to the community because if we're ultimately going to try to create a system of universal care around CCOs, they need to be accountable to the community in a way that everybody would be willing to pay taxes into. Uh, those are more minimal disruptive. Um, but I think it, at the edge of that statement is the idea of creating a public option where any Oregonian would have the ability to buy into the Oregon Health Plan at the state's cost of the Oregon Health Plan. Now that potentially could cover a lot of people who can't afford insurance currently and sit outside of the exchange. And it could be a place where employers, particularly small employers of 50 or less, can find an affordable, benefit, affordable healthcare product with a better benefit than they can currently get. That would potentially be disruptive to the commercial insurance market. So I guess I, I offer the uh, example that I'm not sure that the goal really is to be minimally disruptive. It's to pace change in a way where the system can adapt without the wheels flying off. And we can do all of those things without the wheels falling off. Um, and I do also think that we're at a place where we're ready to create the roadmap for what does it look like when the system changes entirely. And then the real question is the timeline for doing that. So the timeline doesn't feel very uh, ripe when you have an administration in place that wouldn't support any of the necessary federal waivers. But federal politics change. So uh, when that moment of opportunity comes, we need to have a really clear map and find those steps that get us there. So I guess what I felt like our work group was doing with uh, Andrea's leadership and Representative Vile's leadership was starting the process of saying, here's the map to get to that place that isn't minimally disruptive, that is actually the disruptive change we need. Rich, would you like to answer that too? I don't know that I have a lot to add, but I do agree, Martin, that minimally disruptive is a word we had to toss out. Uh, it just wasn't going to, um, to get us to the place that really was going to make a difference. We all want better care for less money, and uh, obviously if we can find a path to do that, it's, it's the right thing to do. And, I agree with Representative Salinas that incremental steps may be our only path right now, but I have to tell you, I think part of what we have to do is do a better job of telling the truth. We've got to actually uh, knuckle down and recognize that um, we are going to be bucking big insurance companies. 
we are going to be dealing with that um, concept. We, we are going to be dealing with that concept of making sure that um, people don't game the system. And as complex as it is today, the games are myriad, and they go on all the time. Uh, government regulation is not a popular thing among a lot of people in this country, not just a, not just a political party, but just period. It's not a popular thing. But uh, if, we're, if we've decided that health care is a fundamental right of every one of us in the community, then it's going to be dramatic. It's not going to be slight and incremental. Thank you. So this is a good time to do the, the reminder here. So for our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum on Tuesday. I'm Vanetta Abdulatif, and I'm speaking with Oregon House Representative Andrea Salinas, Oregon Nursing Association CEO Martin Taylor, and former Oregon House Representative Rich Vile. Okay, let's continue. Um, so um, the report stated that about 80% of those folks that are uninsured um, are actually insurable. Um, so I'd like, and I saw that there was um, a recommendation around getting more or, um, enrollment um, resources out there. I'd like to hear, I'd like to be a fly on the wall. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of those conversations? Um, one around how did we get to the 80% are actually eligible for coverage. And two, I'd like to hear um, a little bit about your conversations about that 20%. Who are they? Who, um, why aren't we able to get them um, under, um, um, get coverage for them? So um, can I start with you, Andrea? Yeah, so um, this is kind of the population, a big chunk of the population that we're targeting are those who we believe can fit under currently um, one of our healthcare um, programs. So either Medicaid or there's, um, they would be eligible for some kind of federal subsidies through the exchange. Um, and folks, the folks that don't have insurance right now, we learned through the work group, are the ones who um, either they lost it through their employer or there's a lot of churn within the Medicaid population so that they, they have possibly had insurance over the past 12 months, but at some point lost that insurance, which goes to Martin's point about doing some type of presumptive eligibility for you know, either primary care or um, you know, some kind of health clinic doctor. But the, um, the biggest, I think, issues are around the, that continuity of care for those who aren't insured right now and don't have any access to that preventive care, and they will go right to the emergency room. Um, we also know that there is a large group of folks who, who are working, and they are undocumented folks. So we know that those folks could also likely pay into the current per member per month Medicaid system and have access to primary care that they don't currently have access to. And so when they are working in you know, agriculture or any other type of um, service industry and business and they get injured, they go straight to the ER. And so we want to avoid that. And we know that um, there's the potential for those folks to also be able to buy into the system. I think she gave a really thorough answer, but do you have something you want to add, Martin? Maybe just two small points. Um, just so there's no confusion, 94% of Oregonians are insured. You're talking about the 80 and 20% of that 6% that are uninsured. So that's important to, to be clear on. And of the 80% that are insurable, um, we did know a lot of them are going to come in and out of Medicaid. And what those folks will experience is as soon as they present for a health condition at a hospital, they'll get insurance. So there is a certain amount of the system not expecting or requiring people to stay insured in order to get health care, which is actually a disadvantage to giving them care when they need it before they're in the ER. There's also a population that opts out that makes over 400% of poverty because you can make quite a bit of money as a small employer, for example, and still not be able to enforce a really expensive health plan, particularly if you've got a pre-existing condition or have the disadvantage of being older. So those kinds of things are where this uh, Medicaid buy-in would help. And I also just want to make one more clarification, which is there's a difference between insurance and access. So that 20% does have access to 
healthcare, at safety net clinics, at the ER. What we're really talking about is making sure that people have the right care in the right place at the right time. And that 20% that's not getting that tends to be folks who are not considered citizens but are residents of the state. And the reality is we're caring for them in the wrong place, at higher cost, at the wrong time. So even that 20%, there's a big incentive to get this right. Appreciate that. I, I, I add just one more thing. One of the things I heard during this process was that there were a group of people, and I didn't hear it in the committee meeting as much as I heard it out knocking on doors, campaigning for office. We're not really interested in coverage. We don't think we need coverage, or it's just too complicated to sign up, or I lost it, and then when I went back to sign up the second time, I couldn't figure out how to sort out what had happened to me the first time relative to now what I had to do. And there is a philosophy among not an insignificant number of people, I believe, that once again, the, the system is rigged, I can't navigate it, and so I'm just going to back off. I have an aunt. Um, who and I told this story in one of the committee meetings in her uh, late 70s now, actually I think she's 80 now, who said, heck with it, I'm not going to keep trying to get the access and get myself covered, I'm just going to pay that penalty. And this was under the Obamacare model. Now she's had some significant health problems, and frankly my wife and I have covered her, which she feels horrible about, she's a very responsible, good human being, but I think this is one of the places where we're going to have to find a way, even under single-payer government systems, to make it much less um, difficult to navigate than, than what I'm seeing the direction we're headed right now. I want to follow that, um, that thread a little bit because I, um, running um, fairly qualified health centers like I do in government, the, um, the challenge with um, government systems and the criticism, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly, is that it's overly bureaucratic. But what also works against you is making sure that you also are accountable for those public dollars. So did you all have any conversations about how to balance um, these um, two competing ideas around simplicity, getting it out to people when they need it and how they need it and quickly, and, um, and be really accountable and transparent for public dollars? So I mean, I think Representative Weil just made the case for single payer. It's, you know, the complexity that we have now is so burdensome on everybody. So not just, you know, the patient and the consumer and the provider. Um, I mean, none of us can figure out insurance and appeals and their whole process. So, I mean, he really did just make the case for it. But I think in our group, um, something that came up that I should have mentioned too is um, yes, we do have to be good stewards of the public dollar. And I think that's what we're going through right now under the coordinated care organization model. Um, we knew that it wasn't going to be an, you know, a smooth, smooth sailing and a you know, smooth road when we started this journey. And so there are some things that we'll be putting in place that I think we need to um, continue with. But I think being good stewards of that public dollar is critically important as we move toward, and we will have to show the federal government this when we apply for our next um, couple of waivers, and whether it's an 1115 or the 1332, we will have to sh be able to show that, that we are spending our dollars wisely and that it is going towards um, better health care. Um, in fact, I just left um, a a hearing, it was our first healthcare hearing um, in the House Healthcare Committee, where um, Director, uh, OHA Director Pat Allen was basically saying, yes, we know that there are still lots of problems, but within Medicaid, the improvement in health outcomes increased by 13%, um, and that was over, I think, a six-year period. Um, we have taken spending down um, quite a lot without what I think we would consider the old-fashioned way of restricting benefits, right? So people are actually getting the care that they need when they need it. Is it per a perfect system yet? Absolutely not. And we need to continue to push and push on our CCOs. But I think that is a big part of what we're trying to do here. So 
I think what you asked, Vanita, is a really, really smart sort of dilemma, which is the public has huge expectations that taxpayer dollars that fund healthcare don't result in fraud, that there's good checks, that there's good outcomes, that there's good systems, and we want those laws. In fact, collectively as the public, we got our legislators to pass all those laws. And then those laws make the system more expensive, particularly laws like HIPAA, which protect your personal information, but is a barrier to almost every communication between providers, right? So the laws that we pass to protect us actually make the system more complicated. I don't think that that's an easy thing to resolve, but I do think there's an awful lot of complexity in the system that is not related to that that we can go after first. And that complexity is every plan, any, every insurance plan, including Medicaid, offers different benefits, different payments, different outcome expectations from providers, different transformational plans, different places that you have to go and has different providers that provide slightly different services. So if you don't know healthcare really, really well, it's incredibly confusing. And we could create a system where we had a standard benefit, we knew transparent costs, that costs were consistent, that we understood the scopes for different providers. In fact, we have a system like that, it's just not called healthcare. It's called public education where there is a standard benefit. We know what hours of the day it's open. We know what months of the school year kids go to school. It's not a simple system, but it's one system. And then if you want more, you can go get your kid coaching or get tutoring or whatever else. It doesn't limit your ability to educate however you want. It simply says, this is the public deal. We offer you this much. It's relatively consistent and universal. I don't know that it's possible to get there with healthcare, but if it is possible to get there with healthcare, to me that's the simpler approach than assuming that government's going to take a lighter hand, because a lot of those things, like we want to evaluate our school system, I mean, whether it's educating our kids well, and we want to protect their privacy. A lot of the things that we associate with government intrusion are actually administrative things that we want and have in other systems. So I, I, I guess maybe I'm arguing for reframing the question a little bit, and what can we do to make the system simpler? And that there's a lot of room for that. But, but once again, we've got we've to call it what it is. And folks, follow the money. The, if, if 30 or 35 percent of the money spent on health care is basically spent on paying folks to do double checks and, and fill out forms and go through all the administrative BS that, that we do with health care, um, there's a lot of jobs at stake. There's a lot of people making a lot of money at, at this game, and we just have to call that out and decide as a society whether we're going to be willing to put a stop to that. I think it's a paradox. It's definitely a, a paradox. Um, there are so many things I want to um, unpack now. I'm like, I forgot about all of you here. I'm like, OK, public education, that's another thing we need to do. Um, let me see if I can form this, um, this question um, succinctly. One of the things that I think is challenging when we start to look at um, systems that are, are government or single payer or, or even with, um, with education, and you talked about um, the value add and being able to get more for your kids or your individuals, as an individual if you could afford it. I'd love to know how you all talked about um, health care and access to these resources for communities of color that aren't around the table, that are experiencing some of the highest um, um, bad outcomes for lots of structural problems in their system, not just um, the ability to pay. Did it come up? I guess that's the first question. And if it did, um, what did you all do about it? So it was never a topic, a, a distinct topic of conversation for us. Um, I've been meeting with um, different communities of color and groups um, knowing that there, you know, our health disparities is a problem that the legislature has been trying to work on for quite some time. Um, I worked with um, Representative Janelle Bynum, Senator Steiner Hayward on the mortality and morbidity of women of color and um, seen a task force to, to try to figure that whole system out, um, but this has been something that is ongoing, and I think part of it is um, going back to, as Martin alluded to, you know, a standardized set of benefits that everyone really knows that they can access, 
Um, but I think a lot of it also does come down to, you know, where, where do folks live? Are our, the networks that we have and the providers that we have, um, are they, you know, in the right places? And, and as Representative Vial alluded to, people go to where the money is flowing. And if it's not in the communities that, you know, can pay, it's not equitable right now. And that's truly where I believe that a, um, a single-payer system would do the most benefit for us. Um, like I said, it wasn't something that was explicitly discussed in the group, but I think it was all um, present. We did have folks from rural health care, um, Oregon Primary Care Association, and then I loop back pretty frequently with, um, with OHE, the Oregon Health Equity Alliance. I'm going to make a quick observation. Looking out there today, I see no one of color in this audience. No one. There's one person of color. She's sitting up here with us on the stand, probably the well, smartest vis person. Well, visual. <laughs> I'll, I'll push you a little bit visual. There's probably people of color here that... Well, and, and, oh. here, and, and that goes to my point. I'm, I'm serving right now, uh, or I just finished my tenure a couple, uh, a week ago, on the Racial Disparity in Housing Task Force. And once again, I heard about persons of color. Now, I happen to have seven adopted Vietnamese children in my home. None of them suffer from not having a good place to live. They've all done very well, but they're of color. They fit that of color piece. What we are dealing with is not so much a um, racial issue as a cultural issue in my estimation, and it has everything to do with education. And I am convinced that those communities, which are primarily darker skinned, perhaps, can be significantly assisted if we can go to them as a community and educate them about how to take advantage of what is being offered by the rest of the community. Most of the situations that I have become aware of stem from not understanding the opportunity. So, um, Rich, I'd like to offer. I think it's. It, I think um, education only goes um, so far, and um, and I think that when um, any kind of um, systems change that would be put into place, we really need to account for not just um, education and knowing about it. Your 80-year-old aunt knows about it but it's too hard to engage because of her age or the complexity. And I think those are some of those same kinds of issues that kind of come up. And we have structural barriers, and that's why we've got really persistent um, inequity. So I, I think it's bigger than that. I'm not saying that that doesn't help, but it's more than that. Well, let me, let me make this, well, okay. Go ahead, clap. <laughs> and, and you're absolutely right. It is bigger than that. I absolutely acknowledge that um, racism still plays a part in our community affairs, as unfortunate and sickening as that is, to me at least. But I have to say, we've tried many, many other ways of addressing some of these problems. And when I say education, I don't mean just, let's try to get the situation in our schools fixed, because we know that's a problem. We've, we've got an audit that tells us that. What I'm saying is that we have to begin inviting the communities that we're talking about to set up their own educational systems that are culturally, and I mean culturally, not necessarily racially, um, designed to, a, to address the way that those communities act. I can tell you from personal experience that my Asian immigrant children do not operate culturally the same way that their brothers and sisters who, who uh, were born and grew up here do. And I remain convinced that this is an answer. It may not be the only answer, but it's a big part of the answer. Okay, I'm gonna move forward. Um, uh, Martin, did you wanna to respond to um, what was um, shared in the work group around this? I don't think we spent enough time on the work group around this. Right. I had a thought, but I also know that there's a sign saying go to Q&A, and I'm going to honor the, well, the direction of the sign. I think that's a timely sign. Okay, so 
For our radio audience, this is the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum on Tuesday. I'm Vanetta Abdulatif, and I'm speaking with Oregon House Representative Andrea Salinas, Oregon Nursing Association CEO Martin Taylor, and former Oregon House Representative Rich Vile. So now we're moving on to audience questions. Um, do we have um, a runner with a... Great. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. My name is Valdez Bravo. Um, I am Vice President of Healthcare for All Oregon and I also work up at the VA hospital, so I saw some of my colleagues here. Uh, my question is this, um, healthcare currently consumes 18% of GDP in the US and the costs are only slated to rise. So 18 cents out of every dollar in America and in Oregon, which healthcare is our second largest economy or uh, industry, 18 cents out of every dollar, every dollar is eaten up by healthcare costs. And it's gonna be 30% by 2050 if we do, don't do anything about it. So it's completely unsustainable. My question is this, um, whether or not you think healthcare is a human right or that everyone should have access to healthcare or that people shouldn't have to rely on ERs to get by on their care, um, is the, how much is the work group looking at ways to pull together a single payer type system or a publicly funded healthcare system to leverage economies of scale to give Oregon the negotiation power to push back against big pharma, to set price gap controls, to bring the fragmented system together so we don't have all that inefficiency and that 35% of excess cost. What are you guys looking from the business sense for the folks that we're not gonna win their hearts and minds that everybody deserves healthcare as a human right, but to say it's just good economic sense and Oregon doesn't have the money to keep paying these astronomical healthcare costs? So this, um, and you're absolutely right, um, this is a growing problem, and this is, I mean, I think really why we're here tonight. And thank you, Valdez, for the question. We didn't look explicitly at pharmaceutical costs or um, hospital cost drivers. There were two separate work groups who actually worked on those specific issues. And I was just talking to um, Vice Chair Nose today. Um, I know there are going to be, I, I believe, several different um, pieces of legislation. I know one will be actually from um, a suggestion from one of the work group members, a statewide um, PBM. Um, we're trying to figure out how to do exactly what you just talked about to leverage the state's power to negotiate on pharmaceutical costs. And so whether it's designing our own PBM or joining other consortiums, we have um, one right now, it's the Oregon Prescription Drug Program that um, Washington and Oregon jointly are administering, but other um, groups and organizations have can purchase into that program. Our Department of Corrections, from what I understand, also can get a very good rate. It's comparable, I believe, to what the Kaiser rate for prescription drugs is. Um, and so we've talked about potentially trying to pull people into the corrections program. It's a consortium through Minnesota, the state of Minnesota. So there are lots of things out there. I think what we have to do is just figure out which one will leverage us um, the best buying power and figure it out from there. In terms of hospital costs, they did a work group where they will be looking at the rate of growth. And um, so for our CCOs, PEB and OWEB, they have stayed under a 3.4% medical um, inflation rate. And I think hospitals are going to try to start even in including private hospitals, are gonna to try to start pushing themselves in a similar direction. So how do they get their costs under control and what is the state's role in that? So their work group also will be rolling out some bills in the next couple of weeks. Rich. Rep Salinas just gave you the healthcare um, genius's answer to what we have been doing. And, and by the way, I don't know how much you can appreciate what a jewel you have in Representative Salinas in the Oregon legislature dealing with this particular issue. It's remarkable. I mean, it's, it really is. But, but we're nibbling at the edges. We're part of a big national system, and that system is really screwed up. In order to fix that system, it's going to take people like Andrea Salinas at the federal level talking to each other. We do not have a way to talk to one another at the federal level in politics right now. The, our, our partisanship is so bad that it, it, it honestly seems impossible to me that we could ever get the fundamental big changes necessary to really address those cost problems. 
And, and, and it's not just at the federal. It's at the local level. I mentioned to Martin earlier today, it was disconcerting for me to walk into the meetings month after month at the Oregon Nurses Association and see my Democratic opponent's signage lining the walls of that building. Their, the partisanship was absolutely clear. It didn't matter that I was trying to do my best to contribute. At the same moment, I was being campaigned against because of partisanship. Until we face that and address it, both at the national level and at the local level, I'm sorry, Valdez, I don't think we're going to do anything except nibble at the edges. So <laughs> let me first issue an apology to Representative Vial. Uh, at the very least, we should have been tactful enough not to have had signs. No, not right? not. <laughs> no but that's fair. Um, <laughs> Look, I mean, you know, I'm sitting between a Democrat and Republican, and in most parts of the country, that's a scary place to be. Uh, we're in Oregon. There's a very long history of bipartisan solutions on health care reform. The Oregon Health Plan was created bipartisan. The CCO legislation was created in a bipartisan way. Uh, we've had great Democrat and great Republican leaders, and Ben Wesselin was all those and an independent for a while. So we've had the whole spectrum of leadership on health care issues. And Oregon is way ahead of the rest of the country because of it. We don't, we don't have a bipartisan legislature now, Martin. Oh, I'm sorry. I, we do not have right. one. No, no and he's, he's right about that. But, but I, the point that I'm making is that the solutions that, are ha that have happened and worked in Oregon did not come from one group of people. They came from bipartisan representation in the political spectrum, and then all of the people of Oregon going to the town halls and the rallies and, and making a difference. That has been a difference between Oregon and the federal level. Now, I, I recognize that things are more partisan now in the country and in the Oregon legislature. And I, to the extent that we did our part to rub that in, I apologize again. But I, I would also say that that is also part of what we need to be thinking about as we look forward to a legislative session where one party probably has the ability to make pretty dramatic changes without the other party's participation. And I do think we'll bit better outcomes if we invite all parties in and frankly more resilient outcomes because over time the things that we do that don't have bipartisan support when the pendulum swings back are the things that get taken away. So there's a value, just a practical value in building a system that works for everybody. Let's move into lightning round. We've got about eight minutes left so, um, so we'll take a question from the floor and then I think we've got a couple of cards. 30 seconds if you can. Tom Sensick, I just paid my $98 so I can answer, ask this question. Um, I want to just say, I'll try to do it 30 seconds, but as you all know, this is much bigger than that. I'm a registered nurse, president of Healthcare for All Oregon. You all want to get involved, get involved. Uh, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Yesterday was Martin Luther King Day. This is Martin Luther King's quote. So it's time to get rid of the injustices. One, you've just led right into it. I'm retired. I got the Kaiser book. I'm supposed to understand that, that little page here, I can't go to a chiropractor anymore? Oh, I can go to a doctor and get my opi opioids for my back pain. Is that where we're headed? We have a plan, and I'll speak to the, right? It's legislative concept 1927. It says in here on line M, a seamless birth to death plan. What's wrong with this plan? The question is this. Do we have to go to the people, or do we have to worry about the legislator to get it done? It's, you're talking about bipartisanship. What about we the people? My question is, do we have to go to we the people? Okay, thank you. Do we have to go to the people? For, to do what House Bill 1046 in the 2017 session and that LC draft proposed, you will ultimately have to go to the people, yes, because that proposal would create a single-payer system by generating a tax that almost has no chance of passing the legislature without a referral back to the people. So even if you had two-thirds, two-thirds, and a governor's signature, that's a, that's a gigantic tax. It'll end up in front of the voters. So to the extent that you're looking for advice, uh, I'd start with the voters. I wouldn't even start with the legislature. I think it's good to vet the idea, but you're going to have to make your case to all Oregonians for all Oregonians to get health care from a single system. And I think that's actually a good role for healthcare for all Oregon. Tom and I have had this um, conversation before. 48% of Oregonians get their healthcare through private insurance. And business 
the business community was not at the table on this issue. And so we need to convince that 48% that going towards single payer is good for them as well. So I um, will ask as many of the questions on the card that I can. Um, but this one, I think, um, will capture most of it. Um, how do you persuade someone with excellent health care insurance through their employer to support single payer universal health care? Remind them that their family members don't all have exactly that same excellent health care. And ask for them to remember that when they are asked to look at a different type of system. Look, I, I, I'm a believer that uh, building off of the foundation that we started with health care reform seven years ago, that the CCO model will eventually be the most affordable and highest quality health care in the state. And all you have to do is give people the option to buy into it, and they will, because it's simply going to be better. But I would not think that telling people, particularly folks in Medicare who like their Medicare plans, that they have to leave that to join a different system is going to be a very successful outcome. And I would just also add that, you know, we've looked at models and different countries that, you know, that can add on to a basic floor. And that's what I would like to see is something that we provide a basic floor of services so that everybody could, you know, access um, certain benefits. But if um, employers can choose to offer higher benefits and a better benefit level, that they still could. And then um, this, you can um, answer this question and then maybe do some closing remarks. So this question in essence is what's next? Will there be legislative um, legislation introduced in the next session as a result of the work group? Yes, so um, I submitted a concept last week that would actually tr um, expand the Medicaid uh, option to for folks to buy into it, um, essentially paying the full freight of the per member per month, and it would allow folks, um, like we had talked about earlier, folks who either don't have access or have um, their premiums are too high under their small employer, um, would be able to buy into the Medicaid program. The piece of legislation in order to get folks to really think about pulling everyone into some sort of healthcare system would be a um, shared responsibility requirements. So essentially, if you don't have a form of health care or health insurance, then you would need to pay a penalty. And with that penalty, I would like to see that go, I think Maryland did something similar, to help pay for that Medicaid buy-in premium and work for more enrollment um, navigators and, and, yeah, advisors. Um, a question from the audience. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, do we still have time, Sam? Last question. <laughs> hey, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, I was reading today about a transparency requirement on hospitals, that very soon they're going to have to list all the costs that go into um, the care that they provide. And I'm wondering if that will, that kind of thing will um, lead in the direction that your committee recommended, or will it make it even more confusing? Well, this goes back to that work group that I talked about around hospital costs. And I do think if it's done in the right way, if you can compare apples to apples, then I think it could be really helpful in the start of trying to push hospitals on their costs. But right now, as it stands, it's really hard to know from one hospital to the next um, what a any given procedure, some, a knee replacement procedure would cost. And so it's, it leaves the consumer in the dark, but it also leaves the governments in the dark, right? So we can't figure out where the true costs are coming from. Is it really, you know, the big fat CEO salary, or is it truly that these devices are really expensive and, you know, the knee replacement device is expensive? I think what we'll start finding out is that there are um, payments being made that probably aren't what taxpayers would like to see. Still time for that closing remarks? So I do want to get back to the last question. I, I think there's some very tangible wins in this next session around health care, whether it's hospital pricing or a Medicaid buy-in or something around making enrollment simpler. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. But there are two things that we really need to spend some time this legislative session that are not low-hanging fruit. They're big, kind of scary ideas. 
I don't know if we get them at 100 percent. I think we need to debate them as if we're going to try. And one of them is the bill that Tom Sinsick referenced earlier that Health Care for All Oregonians is going to support, which is a bill to talk about what would the roadmap to single payer look like and can we create a process. There's calls for a Health Care for All Oregonians commission or board to, to getting there. It's time to really, really take that seriously and see if we can make that really big lift. And the second thing is a proposal that would make primary care uh, something that would have universal access and be one system for primary care. Um, I have to say I know enough about this to be dangerous and not enough to know all the reasons that it might not work, but we have to take that proposal very seriously. I've worked in a lot of legislative sessions. Most of them, the biggest ideas don't happen that session, but frequently they happen in the little mini session, you know, 10, 12 months later. So if we don't take them seriously, we're sort of giving up. But if we do take them seriously, we may not get there, but we may get to a place where it's the next thing we can do. I'm really hopeful about those ideas for next session. And my only observation is that if you don't keep talking about it, nothing's going to happen for sure. Well, with that, our time is up. We'll have to pause the conversation for now. Please join me in thanking Sam Metz for producing today's program. Veneta <laughs> Abdelatif for serving as our moderator and our guests for sharing their insights in Oregon's healthcare system. Thank you all for coming. We have a reception downstairs. Please join us, and I believe some of our guests will be there as well. We are adjourned. <laughs>